presentation on political parties. Well, we have taken a look at how one might define political parties and what the functions of political parties are. Let's take a look at political party history in the United States. Um, we find that America has the oldest political parties in the world, with the exception of one party. Um, you can make the case that the Conservative Party of Great Britain is the oldest political party anywhere in the world uh, based on uh, their history and the activities that they were uh, embarking on or engaging in uh, some time ago. Outside of the Conservative Party, however, of Great Britain, we find that our political parties are the oldest in the world. But what did the Founding Fathers think of political parties? Uh, were they engaged with them? Did they like them? Uh, did they think that they were the way to, uh, they were an important part of our democracy? Well, you find that our Founding Fathers were what? They were universally skeptical of political parties. Um, remember, in the farewell address of George Washington, one of the most important political speeches in the nation's history, we find that George Washington warns us uh, over and over again about the um, perils of political partisanship. So you have George Washington warning us about political parties, and of course, what political party did Washington join? Washington joined neither. Uh, Washington believed that he stood above and needed to stand above political parties, and in fact, he did that. So you have Washington joining neither political party, but again, uh, as an aside, in his heart of hearts, he was probably a Federalist because the um, founder of the Federalist Party, Alexander Hamilton, was his aide-de-camp his primary aide during the Revolutionary War, and then later was his Secretary of the Treasury and his major speechwriter. Basically, almost every major speech that Washington ever uh, delivered uh, was written by Alexander Hamilton. Well, we find that other founding fathers disliked political parties as well. Thomas Jefferson thought that political parties would become nothing more than cliques. Um, remember that word from high school, cliques? He thought they would become cliques uh, that would be predominated by flamboyant uh, individuals, um, and these cliques would cater to and look out uh, for uh, the interests of those flamboyant individuals and not the general public. So he believed that's what uh, would uh, happen to uh, political parties in America. So you find that almost all the Founding Fathers are skeptical about political parties. Now, there are many individuals that I've known over the years who believe that we should simply ban political parties. But can we ban political parties? Uh, I once went to York, Pennsylvania to Charlie Giroux's um, uh, television show. He had a, a regional television show at the time. He's a lobbyist now in Harrisburg. But Charlie Giroux invited me over to debate the uh, uh, proposition with him that uh, we should ban all political parties. Um, I know why he was proposing that. I understand the intent behind that. Uh, I argued that uh, it's impossible to ban political parties. We can ban political parties, but what's going to happen in every election? In every election, people who feel the same about certain types of issues and uh, government action are going to group together and work together. So how can we ban political parties? They'd simply uh, reappear in different forms. Um, so we find though, as a generalization, that political parties in America were disliked by the Founding Fathers. They viewed them as factions and they viewed them as factions that, was, that were motivated by self-interest and by ambition. We find that the first political party in America, now don't confuse this, uh, the first political party in America, for years and years we used to think uh, that it was the Federalist Party, and I used to teach that as a matter of fact, that Alexander Hamilton uh, was the founder of the Federalist Party and that was the first one established. Later, we found more papers 
uh, and uh, correspondence from Thomas Jefferson at the University of Virginia, at Monticello, and at Princeton University, which shows that uh, Jefferson had uh, gotten, the, um, uh, gotten the jump on uh, Alexander Hamilton, and he was first out of the gate. And in fact, the first political party in America is the Democratic-Republican Party, uh, not the Federalist Party. So the first political party in America is the Democratic-Republican Party. We've just begun to teach that a few years ago. We find that um, how were these parties organized? What we found was Jefferson is the founder of the Democratic-Republican Party, which developed a great deal of, uh, uh, of a following and power in the South. We find that, uh, Tom, that uh, Alexander Hamilton then became the founder of the Federalist Party. He had a lot of followers and power in New England. And we find that they built the parties through um, a vehicle called the Committees of Correspondence. The Committees of Correspondence were organizations that were used during the Revolutionary War. These were groups of people that wrote to each other from different parts of the country to share news on how the revolution was progressing uh, in different parts of the country. So when Jefferson and when Hamilton wanted to establish their political parties, they simply wrote uh, these individuals that they had had long relationships with in the committees of correspondence and asked them to join their new, new political party and if they would please help establish one. Well, in addition to that, uh, we find that James Q. Wilson believes, among others, that there are four factors that encourage the development of popularly based national political parties. What are the four factors that we can identify that would facilitate the development of popularly based national parties? Well, one is homogeneity. Uh, John Jay, four very, very uh, important founding fathers, uh, founding father, one of, the, uh, one of the writers of the Federalist Papers, John Jay gives us this quotation. Again, I don't expect you to memorize it, uh, but I do want you to be exposed to it. John Jay says, quote, Providence, or God, Providence has given this one connected country to one united people, a people descended from the same ancestors, speaking the same language, professing the same religion, attached to the same principles of government, and very similar in their manners and customs. So he is stating that one of the factors that uh, help create these national, uh, popularly based uh, political parties uh, was homogeneity. Homogeneity. Again, um, diversity is not a strength of our country, uh, but homogeneity can be a strength. Again, we can have very, very diverse people, but we need to have them with the same political culture. If we have the same political culture, then we can have people of every color uh, and of every ethnic group in the world, and uh, then that is a strength if we share the same political culture. And we've gone over that topic before. But what's the second factor that encouraged the development of popularly based national parties? Well, it's simply that uh, it goes to political culture, that individuals who became regional uh, political, political party leaders, individuals who became regional political party leaders, they shared a, quote, compatibility of the main values. They shared a, quote, compatibility of the main values, unquote. Simply meant that they shared the same political culture. Um, you find that the pre- uh, Revolutionary War committees of correspondence had produced extensive communication among different leaders of the country uh, in different parts of the country. And these leaders did end up sharing a compatibility of the main values. And that is essential uh, if we are going to have a national-based political party across state lines. The third factor which led to the development of popularly based national parties is the office of the presidency. We began to see how powerful the presidency could be 
and that if we wanted to capture this particular um, office, that we were going to have to have uh, a national effort, and the national effort was going to have to be well coordinated. So this particular new office, um, this particular new office uh, with substantial power was a prize worth winning. And the only way you could capture it if you had cooperation among office holders and party activists and coalitions of interests across state lines. Fourth and finally, another factor that led to the development of popularly based national political parties is the extension of suffrage. We simply find that as the vote is given to more and more and more people, to people that owned no property, and then people that, uh, to women, and then to uh, people who were not literate, as we give the uh, vote to more and more people, uh, then in order to win elections, you've got to appeal to all those people. You have to communicate with all of them, and again, this leads to popularly based national political parties. Well, what I want to point out to you uh, is found in this, uh, this particular slide, which isn't on your, um, this particular slide is not uh, in your PowerPoints. Here's a homemade slide this I would normally put on the board. Uh, this tries to show all of you that there are three eras of political party history in America. There's three eras of political party history in America, and uh, certainly there are sub-eras within those, and we'll talk about that as we talk about political party history. Let's take a look at what these three eras are. In the first political party era, which goes between 1787 and 1824, we have the Democratic-Republican Party, and is opposed by the Federalist Party. Then, of course, with the election of 1824, and we've talked about this before, and the explosion of the uh, Democratic-Republican Party, out of that explosion came the Democratic Party, and in response to the Democratic Party, the Whig Party emerged, W-H-I-G, the Whig Party. This party system lasted between 1824 and 1860, and in 1860, we have the third political party system emerging that we uh, still have today, and that is the system of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party between 1860 and the present day. So these are the three eras of political party history that we have in America. Well, let's take a look at the first political party era. Um, of course, this goes from um, the writing of the Constitution in 1787 all the way to 1824. Uh, we find that uh, everyone was skeptical of political parties, and the only individual in the country who was capable of holding all political factions together in all areas of the nation together was George Washington, since he had led uh, our revolutionary armies to victory against the British Empire. And George Washington was aware of his importance and he was aware of the uh, special position that he held. Therefore, he was willing to accept the chair of the Constitutional Convention once we proved ourselves unable to revise the Articles of Confederation in a way that would make them acceptable to the whole country. So first he accepted the draft to be the head of the army during the Revolutionary War, and after the war, eventually he would have to be the chair of the Constitutional Convention, and after that he would have to be the person who would be the first president. Again, George Washington, what political party did he join? None. Uh, he was above political parties, he knew he had to be a role model for other leaders, uh, and he was careful not to join either party. Interestingly enough, he has the leaders of both political parties in his cabinet with him. Uh, he has Thomas Jefferson, uh, the founder of the Democratic-Republican Party, as his Secretary of State, and he has Alexander Hamilton, the, uh, the uh, founder of the Federalist Party, in his cabinet as his Secretary of the Treasury. 
And so he has both of these individuals in his first cabinet. And it would have been interesting to be a fly on the wall in uh, those meetings and hear Jefferson and Hamilton debate and how Washington would have responded. Uh, we find that after the first term of Washington, Jefferson has had it. He can no longer listen to Alexander Hamilton, can no longer deal with the day-to-day -day squabbles and fighting, and he yearns for the tranquility uh, of Monticello and the Virginia countryside. And so after one term, after four years of being Secretary of State for George Washington, he returns to Monticello, he returns to Virginia uh, for, a brief, um, for a brief respite and a brief vacation. Well, you find that, of course, Washington's vice president was John Adams, uh, a Federalist from Massachusetts, one of the most important leaders during the, uh, during the Revolutionary War, one of the three primary writers of the uh, Declaration of Independence, of course, the principal author was Jefferson, um, but uh, we have it, uh, the fact that he was assisted uh, extensively by Benjamin Franklin and by John Adams uh, after he came out with his first draft. We also had uh, a larger committee with Roger Sherman and Robert Livingston also taking a look uh, at the declaration before it was finally issued. So there's a committee of five that was responsible for the Declaration of Independence, but there were three primary authors. Uh, the primary author was Jefferson, assisted by Franklin and John Adams. Well, after uh, Alexander Hamilton, probably the second most important Federalist leader was John Adams. It's interesting that John Adams and Alexander Hamilton don't necessarily get along uh, like peas in a pod. They're, uh, they can be contentious with one another as well. Nonetheless, John Adams is Washington's vice president. And so Washington, after two terms of office, as two terms as president, has decided he's had enough. And the country's had enough. He believed that he needed to set a precedent, set an example for future presidents to step down after two terms. Um, we find that the Constitution uh, that was written at that time did not put a limit on presidential terms of office. Uh, so because of that, Washington set a precedent, believed he set an example, serve two terms, you can be elected for a second time, step down, do not run for a third term. And that's exactly what he did. So John Adams, his vice president, ran for president after him. John Adams is elected in the um, presidential election of 1796. And we find that uh, this uh, inaugural for John Adams occurred in Philadelphia. And as Washington stepped out from the rostrum, rostrum and Adams ascended the uh, rostrum, uh, Washington uh, gives Adams a little bit of a hug, a little bit of an embrace, and he says, I am fairly out, <laughs> and you are fairly in, and I'm going back to Mount Vernon. Uh, Washington wanted to rest as well. Uh, he went years uh, without seeing Mount Vernon and years without seeing uh, his uh, extended family in Virginia, though he was happy to return uh, to Mount Vernon after those two terms. Well, John Adams then uh, leads the Federalists between 1796 uh, and 1800. Going into the election of 1800, uh, we are setting the scene for what becomes the most important election in American history. We find that Thomas Jefferson and the Democratic Republicans defeat uh, John Adams and the Federalists in the election of 1800, um, largely because uh, there, is, uh, there are storm clouds on the horizon. Um, we have difficulties with the French and the British regarding regulations at sea, uh, regarding uh, conflicts at sea, and um, we find that the Adams administration was doing what the people wanted and what was the right thing to do to, um, to uh, quell those particular uh, situations. But uh, by the time that their negotiations had borne fruit and the news was given back, transported back to America, transmitted back to America, 
it was too late to affect the election of 1800. Uh, if that had happened, maybe Adams would have won. The interesting thing, who was Adams' opponent? Adams' opponent in the election of 1800 was his good friend, Thomas Jefferson. In fact, Jefferson serves as Adams' uh, vice president during Adams' time in office. Uh, that was a time and an era before we, um, we rewrote uh, our um, uh, election uh, processes and our constitution so that the president and the vice president would have to run together. Previously, they did not, and so you could have a president and a vice president of two different political parties, as we had with Adams and Jefferson. Adams, a Federalist, and Jefferson, a Democratic-Republican, being president and vice president. Well, uh, we find that Jefferson does win the presidential election of 1800. Uh, we find that Adams's um, advisors tell him not to surrender uh, the White House. The government had now moved from Philadelphia uh, to uh, Washington, D.C., and Adams was the first American president to uh, take up residence in Washington, D.C. Well, Adams uh, did not listen to his advisors who told him he should just simply invoke provisions of the Alien and Sedition Acts and not surrender the White House to Jefferson, uh, that Jefferson and his advisors were rabble and uh, they should not be allowed to come in the White House. Now, Adams uh, simply followed the law, and he did turn over the government to the Democratic Republicans. This is why the election of 1800 is our most important in national history. It's the first time that one political party lost elections to another political party and had to surrender power. It's the first time that control of the White House passed from one political party to the other, and it did so peacefully. It did so through ballots, not bullets. And that was um, remarkable in that day and age. So consequently, the election of 1800 is very uh, yeah, significant in American history. Well, this begins a period of time where we find remarkable success by the Democratic-Republican Party. We find that Jefferson uh, serves two terms in office, just as Washington did. And what many historians haven't recorded very well and don't know is how um, closely bound Jefferson had to Congress. The Congress was controlled by the Democratic Republicans and um, not noted in many American history books is how uh, tightly disciplined um, Jefferson had the Democratic Republican leaders of the Congress. Uh, when uh, he asked for things, they delivered. Uh, and his main, um, if you will, main taskmaster, his main ta tactician, uh, Jefferson was a good uh, man to develop strategy, um, but to put that strategy uh, into effect on the ground, the person he relied on uh, throughout his life was none other than his neighbor, uh, James Madison. So James Madison steps up as the next president of the United States. So Jefferson uh, serves as our third president, serves two terms, steps down, and again, uh, Jefferson had been the Secretary of State for Washington. Now Madison had been the Secretary of State for Jefferson. So Madison comes in and he serves two terms in the presidency. And as his second term is ending, who does he turn to? He turns to his Secretary of State, another neighbor from Central Virginia, James Monroe. And he turns to James Monroe as the next presidential candidate. James Monroe wins uh, and indeed serves two terms as president, again steps down and follows the precedent of George Washington. Uh, well, we're doing what? We're having one Secretary of State after another after another um, become the next president. The pathway to the presidency was the Secretary of State's position. So, who was the Secretary of State for James Monroe? Well, it was none other than the brilliant John Quincy Adams. Now, John Quincy Adams, you have to realize, of course, was the son of John Adams, one of the leading uh, members of the Federalist Party. But you find that uh, uh, after 1816, the Federalist Party 
uh, its power had waned. After 1816, the Federalist Party no longer contests uh, the presidency. Uh, it becomes much more of a regional party. And the Democratic Republican Party is uh, the one who tends to control the presidency and the Congress. Um, we find they do this because they have been very successful in selling their message where? The Democratic Republican Party is based in the South, the Federalist Party is based in New England. You had to sell your program in the Middle Atlantic area. And uh, the Democratic Republican Party at this time was doing uh, a good job of selling their program to the people and the voters of New York, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, and Maryland, and Delaware. And they were the ones who were determining which party would be in office, the Federalists or the Democratic Republicans. Now, it's good to take a, a moment here to realize what the two parties uh, stood for. Of course, the Democratic Republican Party, the first political party, stood for a, the establishment of a national government that, was, uh, that had powers that were tightly circumscribed. Um, the Democratic Republican Party was interested in maintaining states' rights, and they were concerned that the national government could become tyrannical. That was their major concern uh, with uh, government. The Federalist Party, led by Alexander Hamilton, was just the opposite. Uh, they wanted a strong national government with broad powers. Um, they believed that this was necessary uh, in the aftermath of the Revolutionary War and in the aftermath of the uh, failed experiment uh, of a nation under the Articles of Confederation. So this is what the uh, two parties essentially are standing for um, as we approach the election of 1824. Um, of course, the election of 1824, the nomination of the Democratic Republican Party, uh, which wins election after election and becomes um, the, um, uh, the instrument that selects presidential candidates for the two parties at this time, is the caucus of the U.S. House of Representatives. So all the Federalists in the U.S. House of Representatives gather together and they pick Federalist candidate for president. All the uh, members of the Democratic Republican Caucus, so all the members of the Democratic Republican Party in the U.S. House of Representatives, they meet secretly and they choose a Democratic Republican candidate for the presidential race. Uh, since they were so successful, Jefferson two terms, Madison two terms, Monroe two terms, and ultimately John Quincy Adams one term, we find that that caucus becomes known as King Caucus. King Caucus. Well, in 1824, uh, and we've covered this briefly before, um, the Democratic Republican Caucus wants to go with John Quincy Adams. Highly intelligent. His father was a former president. Uh, he had distinguished himself in every way. Um, and they choose um, John Quincy Adams as their candidate and Andrew Jackson, the victor, of the Battle of New Orleans as their vice president. They did not uh, count on Andrew Jackson's ambition or his vanity, however. Andrew Jackson said, I will be the second to no man. I will run for the presidency myself. And he did. So we have a second Democratic-Republican candidate for the presidency. So we've talked about this before. Once he announces for the presidency, of course, the state uh, that, uh, uh, that Andrew Jackson uh, comes from, of course, is Tennessee, and the state that has a lively rivalry with it is Kentucky, and Kentucky is the home of Henry Clay. Henry Clay is the Speaker of the U.S. House of Representatives, arguably the most powerful man in the country, but he says, I will not let Andrew Jackson become the president. I uh, need to contest for the presidency as well. Um, and he does so. So we have a third Democratic-Republican candidate. Then we have a candidate from the Deep South in William Crawford. William Crawford believes that uh, the Deep South needs a presidential candidate, and he offers up himself. So we have four Democratic-Republicans running for the presidency in 1824. Democratic Republican Party explodes with this type of competition. Uh, we find that 
Andrew Jackson wins the most popular votes. He wins the most electoral college votes. But we find that he doesn't win a majority of electoral college votes, which is necessary to win the presidency. The presidential election is thrown into the U.S. House of Representatives, and in the U.S. House of Representatives, we find Henry Clay approaches John Quincy Adams, and he says, I will throw my support to you and make you president if you make me your, guess what, Secretary of State. John Quincy Adams agrees. Many people believe that this is uh, called the deal that the devil sealed uh, in American history. Uh, but indeed, uh, Henry Clay throws all his support to John Quincy Adams when the U.S. House of Representatives meets to decide who's going to be the next president. Only the top two vote-getters are allowed to compete. Each state has one vote, so all the representatives from each state gather and they cast one vote collectively. Um, we find that uh, John Quincy Adams wins, and lo and behold, Henry Clay is the next Secretary of State. So now John Quincy Adams begins his term as president, and you find that uh, it's a very miserable, lonely, besieged term, term of office because the press continues to be critical of him, all of Andrew Jackson's supporters, uh, tend to be unhappy, and they actually storm out of the Democratic-Republican Party. They meet in churches and general stores and private homes, and they form a new political party, the Democratic Party. And the Democratic Party is the form to put Andrew Jackson into the presidency in 1829 by winning the presidential election of 1828. They're planning ahead. Um, you find that, uh, of course, in physics, as we said before, for every action there's a reaction. In politics, for every movement there's a counter movement. Well, just as we had the formation of a Democratic Party, we had all the leftover Democratic Republicans who didn't like Andrew Jackson and his government philosophies. They, met, they uh, grouped together uh, with the leftover Federalists. So the Federalists and the Democratic Republicans who didn't like Andrew Jackson formed a new political party, the Whigs, W-H-I-G-S, W-H-I-G-S. So we have a second political party era now, the Whigs and the Democrats. And let's take a break here. Got it. Okay, I knew that.